In the next few videos, we're going to be working with arithmetic modular 2. Um, so we're going to deal with all even numbers are equal to 0, and all odd numbers are equal to 1. So for instance, 2 times 3 is 6, which is an even number, so it's 0. And 7 plus 3 is 10, which is also even, which is 0. Um, for another example, is negative 3 equals 1 in this case. So anytime we do arithmetic, for the most part, when we add, we're only going to be caring about the parity of that number. And this is going to be, um, there are multiple reasons for this, one of which is simplicity, the other of which is, is that it's related to um, computer science. So we're going to let z mod 2 be exactly those numbers. Um, and with the arithmetic that I just said, so 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, which is 0, and then multiplication similarly. 0 times 1 is 0, and 1 times 1 is 1. And we'll also work with vectors whose entries are elements of z mod 2. So these are going to be vectors of the form x1 all the way up to xn, where x1 through xn are in z mod 2. And we can also do arithmetic um, the way we usually do with vectors, with vectors of this sort, by just adding component-wise and scalar multiplication on each um, components as well. The interesting thing about um, this vector space is that unlike the vector space r to the n, this has finitely many vectors. So how many vectors does this vector space have? Well, first of all, here there are two elements. And if you have n component vectors, think how many entries, think what possibilities you can put in that first entry. You can either put a 0 or a 1. And as soon as you move to the next entry, you can also put a 0 or a 1. And therefore, each time you go through these entries, you have 2 to the n total possibilities. So the number of vectors in z mod 2 to the n is 2 to the n. And one of those vectors is very special, namely the 0 vector. And the non-zero vectors, well, there's just one less of them. And I know that sounds like a trivial um, thing to point out, but it'll actually be important in our discussion. And so for example, this is the main example that we'll be working with. z mod 2 to the third power has seven non-zero vectors, for example. So let's make a definition first. First, we're going to be exploring a lot of um, mathematical curiosities, and then we'll see how they apply to an actual um, physical situation. And I'd rather you have a little bit of suspense before we get there. So first, we're going to do some math, and then we'll talk about the applications. So a Hamming matrix is a matrix H with k rows and the columns of H consist of all the non-zero vectors in z mod 2 to the kth power. So k here is a non-negative integer. Um, in fact, let's just yeah, suppose it's a positive integer. So for example, when k is 3, we have seven non-zero vectors. And what this is telling us is that we should just list every single one of them for the columns of this matrix. And you could list them in whatever order you want to. And I'm going to choose this order that I find very convenient for calculations. So for example, when k equals 3, we can write h to be 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. So I'm going to write the unit vectors first for the first three columns. And then we'll write everything else. And I'll also choose a specific order for this, though this part is less relevant um, in terms of ease of computations. 
So notice that this matrix, when you write it in this order, at least um, part of it has a very nice form. The left-hand side of this matrix is the identity 3x3 three three matrix. And the right-hand side is just another matrix consisting of all the non-zero vectors excluding the unit vectors. So we'll just call that Q for now. So I've just you know, artificially divided this matrix into a 3x3 three three and a 3x4 matrix. And in general, given if k was arbitrary, we can also do something very similar. We can choose, again, this is up to us, to have a matrix H of the identity with a k by k here. So this is going to have, because we're working with vectors um, of length k, then this is going to be the identity k matrix. And then another matrix Q here, and you can ask, OK, we know how many rows the matrix Q has. How many columns does it have in this case? So we need to list all of the non-zero entries. And we know the number of non-zero entries is 2 to the k minus 1. And we've already used k of them. So Q is a k by 2 to the k minus 1 minus the k vectors, the k unit vectors that we've already chosen. So is a k times 2 to the k minus 1 minus k matrix, consisting of all the other non-zero vectors. OK, now let's set M to be another matrix. So I, I guess I define it this way. Um, so now let M be another matrix. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the matrix Q and use that to construct another matrix. So Q on top. Now this has, as, as it points out, K, right, the K rows and 2 to the K minus 1 columns. So, and I'm also going to throw in another identity matrix here. And in order for this matrix to even make sense, it has to be of this dimension. So let's call this um, for a second um, L. So this is um, another matrix that we've constructed. And it has k plus L, in other words, 2 to the k minus 1 rows, and 2 to the k minus 1 minus k columns. OK, so in, the, in, case, um, in case we were working with our example, M would be the same matrix Q here, so literally this matrix right here, and then the identity matrix. But in order for this identity matrix to make sense, it has to have four rows and four columns, so that identity is 4 by 4. Well, let's just point out some facts about these different matrices. First of all, H is a surjective matrix. It corresponds to a linear transformation from z mod 2 to the seventh power to z mod 2 to the third power. So h is surjective. And we'll prove these in a second. Some of the proofs are very quick, and some of them are a little bit more involved. Secondly, m is injective. In other words, it's one to one. So surjective is onto and injective is one to one. And third, the kernel of H equals the image of M. In other words, the null space of H is the column space of M. So let's prove these facts. I think the proofs are pretty cool, so that's why I think it's uh, fun to do this. So the first one is not too bad at all. So H is already in reduced echelon form. And we already know it has three pivots, and therefore it's on two. So that's the end of that. Two. In order to show that M is injective, we have to show that the kernel of M is zero. Another way of saying that is that the columns of M are linearly independent. But this is obvious by looking at the columns, because if we look at the identity matrix, 
it doesn't matter what's going on up here. We already know that all of these are linearly independent, and therefore the columns of consisting of the Q matrix on top and the identity matrix on bottom are also linearly independent. So the columns of the identity matrix are linearly independent, and therefore the same is true for M. So these two proofs are not bad. The third one isn't bad either, but it's definitely a little bit more involved. So in order to show that the kernel of one matrix equals the image of another, we have to show that both inclusions hold, namely that the kernel is a subset of the image and the image is a subset of the kernel. So first we'll prove that the kernel of H is, contains the image of M. So we'll do that first. And to do this, what we'll do is we'll compute the product H times M. And so we're looking at, so when we take H times M, we're looking at the image of M, and then we're applying H, and we'll show that that matrix is the zero matrix, which means that the kernel, that the image is inside the kernel. So if we compute HM, and this is also an interesting um, observation that we'll make, because when we compute this product, we will break the matrices up and compute them. And I'll do this for the 3 by 4, just so we we're, we're concrete, though I don't have to. The same computation works if we use an arbitrary k. When you do matrix multiplication with matrices inside of another matrix, you can, as long as the operations make sense, namely when the rows and the columns match up, so the columns of the first matrix here match the number of rows in the top matrix. The number of columns here match the number of rows here, which they do. So in this case, we have identity 3 by 3 times Q plus, right, because we're doing this kind of matrix product and we should get a single matrix out of this, Q times the identity 4 by 4. And the identity times any matrix is Q itself, and likewise when it's on the right, and so when you put these two together, you just get 2 times Q back. Right? This is 2 times the matrix Q. But the number 2 in our situation is equal to 0. So this equals the 0 matrix. And it is a what by what matrix? It is a 3 by 4 matrix. So this is a 3 by 4 matrix here. So this shows that the image is in the kernel because when we look at the image of M, we're looking at all of the, the span of the columns of M is the image. And if each of those columns gets sent to 0, then um, it's in the kernel of H. So that's one direction. And then the other direction, so to prove that the kernel of H is in the image, this will also be a neat um, technique and tool from linear algebra. We're going to do a little bit of counting. So since M is injective, we can compute the rank and the nullity of M. So for example, the dimension of the image of M equals Four, right? Because we have four linearly independent columns, so the dimension is four. And since H is surjective, then we know that the rank of H is three. So the same thing, the dimension of the image of H equals three. But because the dimension of H is three, by rank nullity, the dimension of the kernel is 7 minus that 3, which gives us 4. Therefore, the dimension of the kernel of H equals 4. OK. Now, we've already shown that the image of M is in the kernel of H. And we also know that the dimensions of both of them are the same, 
And therefore, the only way that that's possible is if these two are actually equal to each other. Because we're talking about two different subspaces, one contained in the other. They have the same dimension, which means they have to be the same subspace. So by um, the previous, by, the, by this part, by kernel of h, or rather since kernel of h is in the image of m, this implies that these two subspaces are actually the same. And that concludes the, the proof of this theorem. Now, let me point out something um, that's not required um, for what we're about to say, but let me make an interesting connection um, between this idea and something um, that I've seen in a different context, namely in the context of um, homological algebra and algebraic topology. And if we think of these, all of these um, matrices as coming from linear transformations, what they're describing is you have m to be a linear transformation from z mod 2, 4 to z mod 2, 7. So this is where m is coming in. And this map is injective. So we can think of this as, let's say this is the 0 vector subspace. In this case, the image of this map is the kernel of m which just means the kernel of m is 0 because the image of this is 0. And here we have h. And h maps to z mod 2 to the third power. And again, w this theorem says that the kernel of h is the image of m. And finally, it ends up at 0. And this is just take every vector and send it to the 0 vector. Now, if we look at the um, image of h here, the image of h is all of z mod 2 to the third power, and the kernel of this map is also all of z mod 2 to the third power. And you, we can concisely say these three facts by simply saying, simply if, if you've heard of the terminology, that this sequence of linear transformations is an exact sequence. So I just find it very interesting that the notion of an exact sequence um, actually shows up in this context. And in the next video, we'll start to um, unravel more of the properties